It's talking about love and stuff, though, when you talk about um, loving people. Can a practicing homosexual go to heaven? Can a practicing homosexual go to heaven? Depends on, I guess, your view. I, I want to ask this question. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask a question. And by the way, you should be sitting up here. I'm just, I, I come to check it out, man. Okay. Right. <laughs> I just want to admonish that to you, young man, that you should be up here, and there should be one at your church. Okay? <laughs> Throw one in the back in your court. Um, on Facebook, did, nonetheless. Yeah, I did, That's didn't I? Did I really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, His oh, wife's going to read You've me. been called out. We're laughing. Did the practicing homosexual choose Jesus as Savior? That's my question first before I answer your question. We'll see, we're going, we're going to... You, you have to answer something? the question. Did, did the individual can, you're talking... Can, can you be chosen by God and then continue in this... You were talking about repentance and things earlier too. And part of it's going to go with Scripture and the high view and literal view of Scripture and stuff and, and what it says. And I understand love and love being for people. Mm -hmm. And wanting what's best for somebody, mm -hmm. and of course that you know love doesn't need equal acceptance, you know of whatever lifestyle that is, um, and just like repentance, that's a continuous thing that a Christian has to do. We continually repent because you know, we all continually sin. Um, I, I'm going to go with it based upon the scripture, though, and. and can you be a Christian and be a practicing homosexual? Well, I want to take it in the book of Revelation where it lists all those things. Would it be a liar, thief, homosexual, witchcraft? And, and my answer to that one is that each of those individuals are all habituals. They're all habituals. They haven't quit. So when I answer that question, for me... Because they're habituals, I can never prove that they truly chose Jesus. Because the hiccup that I face is can a practicing alcoholic get into heaven? And, and what we've learned about alcoholism is that it's such a strong addiction that it's become a disease and it chooses that person to go down that path. I've already said it earlier, and I'll still stand by it. If the individual's chosen Jesus, their name is sealed in the book of life. And what they do after that, whether they practice holiness or not, they're going to heaven. Which beer will send you to hell? The first one or the 20 a day? If you're an alcoholic and you're drinking every day, is it the beer you're drinking today that's sending you to hell? Or was it the first beer that you had ten years ago? If they're a practicing homosexual, which relationship sent them to hell? The homosexual relationship? What sent them to hell was the lack of relationship with God. So my answer to the question for me, I don't know where they are yet, is that the practicing individual that's in sin, do they have a relationship with God? If they were sealed, then they're sealed. And at any moment, they could walk in holiness. When will they walk in holiness? Not a clue. What will it take them to walk in holiness? I don't know. But I do believe that they're sealed for heaven. And that's why... If Jeffrey Dahmer chose Jesus, he'd be up there in heaven. And and to me, he's the epitome right there with Hitler because of what they did. But if they chose Jesus, then they get to go into, into heaven. So that's where I am. You guys better tag in. Um. <clears throat> I think it comes down to actual, um, not repentance in the sense of um, have you stopped? Because we all have sin that we don't stop. Um, th there was a period in my life, I, I was saved as a teenager, 
But then um, early on in college, um, I, I was walking in um, sin. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and it was, I, I was walking in my lifestyle of sexual immorality. And, but here's the thing. If you were to come to me and say, what are you doing? This is what God's word says. I would admit to you, yeah. yes, you're right, I'm in sin. And, 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 I, and I actually had some back and forth of I'm guilty. I, I was wrestling. The Holy Spirit was convicting me. Even though I wasn't following, I was being convicted, and, and I was wrestling through that. And, and if you were to say, doesn't the Bible say, didn't Jesus tell you this is wrong? And I'd say, yes, it is, you're right, and, I, and I'd repent, and then I'd probably fall back into it again later. If you have someone who's actively walking in a sin, any sin, and you were to say, you said you're following Christ. The scripture says you're walking in sin. And if their heart, if their mind says, yes, you're right, I know, and, 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 and I'm sorry, and they're repentant, even if they fall back into it. But if it's someone who's saying, I don't care. This is who I am. You can't tell me how to be. This is my life. That, that person's not repentant. That is not a mindset that is surrendered to God, that, that has said, you are Lord. And I think that that's what it comes down to is our spirit of rebellion. And are we going to say, God, you are Lord? Are we going to try to be Lord of our life? Or are we going to let him be Lord of our life? And so we, we all struggle and walk in. And there's sometimes when we walk in sin, and we're not even thinking about it as being sin. Maybe we're just ignoring or in denial of it being sin. But the Holy Spirit can light us up. And yes, we, we recognize. And, and so I, I think it's possible that someone can be in maybe a state of ignorance or maybe just a state of denial, um, that it's something that they're struggling, that from the outside we look and we say, hey, they're, they're walking in a, a way that's not biblical, but the Holy Spirit is tearing them up on the inside because they're actually not who they are. That's not who they are. They're a child of God. They're in Christ, but they're walking in sin. Um, and so I, but it's one of those things that I'm going to say it's possible with the qualifier that is a major red flag that if someone is habitually walking in a type of sin that is clearly said, do not do this, but they're walking in it unrepentantly, then that's a big red flag that, hey, maybe Jesus isn't Lord of your life. Um, so, I mean, we have to deal with, I think, presuppositions here. And it's a good question in one way because it's one that society is obsessed with. It's um, any Christian who gets their name in the public is going to get thrown with that question immediately, I think. Honestly, I don't think it's coming from concern for LGBT people. For a lot of people who ask this question, it's just a, an easy way to, to get the Christian out. But um, you, you, have to, you have to contextualize this, as, as, everyone else, as everyone here has done, and not just take for granted society's secular, worldly presuppositions of what is a person and how does a person exist in this category and in that category, where on the one hand, society will want to tell you that there are absolute binary categories of sexuality, of sexual orientation, and then when it's convenient, they're going to totally switch over and say, no, it's all fluid, that sometimes we're this and sometimes we're that. And I've heard the same, I have heard the same people, and my, I'm, in, I'm a sociologist, one of the most secular, progressive fields, I've heard the same people say both in the same day, right? And, and so we have a different view of what a person is, and it really does go to this view of in relationship with God, that's a category, out of relationship with God. So we have to ask, well, what... What does this person's lifestyle look like? What does this person's heart toward God look like? How do they feel about their sin? Not just this particular sin, even if that's what we're being demanded to focus on. No, we can't. Um, how do they understand their sin? Is, is there anguish? I mean, like, I, I really resonated with the story he told, that at a certain point in my college life, after, after getting saved, I had a period where I was too much uh, partying with friends, mostly that, that was uh, using alcohol as a way that God doesn't allow for. And... I would be like, I'd wake up miserable, depressed. Oh my goodness, I can't believe I got drunk with my friends again, right? That, uh, that's not what God... And then I'd go talk to brothers or sisters in Christ about it and confess that towards them. And so for a while, I was, uh, you know, binge drinking at a secular university with friends. Hated it. Hated myself for it, off and on, and off and on. And eventually I got that together. That was the end of my trajectory, uh, and I, I, that's not how I live. Um, so, but... It wouldn't have made sense to just say no context necessary. Don't don't elaborate on this at all. Can't, are you going to are are you a, are you a, a drinking partying Christian who loves that? Uh, yes or no? Don't give me any context. Don't share your heart with me. Your relationship with God doesn't matter. Yes or no? Right? But that's what society asks for us on the other issues where it's a wedge issue. But we have to stand our ground, tease out the presuppositions that that are being brought up, that are being brought here, 
what are the culturally loaded terms? And we, we just have to start with truth and end with truth, not meet them halfway. Because, I mean, we're talking about a salvation issue. It's serious business, that it, so much that it does require us digging our, our, our heels in the ground. I think you, you're a pastor, I'm assuming, from y'all's back and forth. I think uh, if... Yeah, he's a good one, too. <laughs> I, I, I'm not making a judgment on his pastoring or anything. I'm just asking. Okay. I, I think there's this... I think there's a huge danger of them not going to heaven, just as much as there's a huge danger of 75% of men who are in pews every day looking at pornography not mm-hmm. going. Um, and you know that as well as I do. Um, for some reason, I've talked about funerals a lot tonight. My first two funerals as a pastor were suicides. Wow. One was a 24-year-old who hung himself from his doorpost, and the other one was my wife's grandfather, who had Parkinson's real bad and wasn't going to go to a rest home. It didn't matter what family, whether I was kin to them or not, they were concerned about the eternity of their soul. And this might be a cop-out or not, but I choose to believe it was the Holy Spirit. The only thing I could say to them was, I leave them in the hands of a God that created them and loves them. Because God knows. And that might be a cop-out. I know I'm to love them as best I can, and that will mean saying, I think your lifestyle is sinful. I think your lifestyle... Is not of God, just like I think an alcoholic, just like I think men that are addicted to porn and go to strip clubs, just like I think my lifestyle of probably overeating and need to lose some weight of gluttony probably isn't of God. Um, but I think I can't get hung up into are they going to heaven or hell. That's God's job. And, and um, I think when I start getting hung up into that, that, that might affect how I treat them lovingly. If I think, well, they're going to hell, so I don't really have to do anything with them. Thing. I don't know. I'm not saying that about you. I'm talking about me now. I want to make that clear to everyone here. Um, but I think, I don't know, but I leave them in the hands of a God that created them and loved them. I know an overwhelming majority of gay men, at least, statistics show, were raped as men by, as boys by other men. Jesus knows. He, only he knows how that affects someone. I've never been, I've never, think. Praise God, that's never happened to me. I was around good men. Um, like he said, there's a lot of tactile stuff that, uh, because we don't know, I'm, I'm going to choose to let God who does know handle it. And, uh, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> two, two of the greatest preachers um, proclaimed for years the salvation of Jesus before they met Jesus. Wesley was one of them. He had been preaching for a long time. And then one day he realized, wait, I don't know Jesus. And he chose him as Savior and Lord. Another one was is Moody. He would buy his sermons because the night before he was drinking. Then he would go stand in the street corner and he'd preach that sermon that he paid for. <laughs> wow. and, and then finally something happened and changed his life. And that was the relationship. And that anointing began to take place. So, I don't know until they die where they're going to go, and I won't know where they go until I die whether they get there. Uh, Because I I have the scripture, I have the idea, and and the first premise is if they've chosen Jesus, they're sealed. They're adopted. And And that's where I struggle, and that's where I'll always end and lean because so many people deny God on another level. It's just we've compart- compartmentalized. Thank you. Oh, I'm really struggling tonight, guys. <laughs> That's their sin. What's my sin? What's Mark's sin? What's your sin? We've got a list. And one of the things that you know, like I brought up earlier, is when you when you pray for your dinner, well, that's trying to show respect for God. But did you begin on what you were supposed to cook? Did you begin when you were at HEB getting ready to spend the money? Maybe you should have turned the quarter and gave it to the homeless person and not bought anything. We could all skip a meal. I, I, mean, I don't know. I, I think our relationship with God needs to be deeper. Not worried about them or they but worry about us a little bit more and, and, and reach out and love people more. And uh, 
I've told my daughters, and I think I've lived it, and Mark knows this, anybody can come on our table and eat. It's going to be a mess. It's a dirty table. But you want to bring anybody in this house, bring them in. Let them eat. Now, if they're a smoker, I'm not going to let them smoke in my house. Okay? But they can still come in. And then they can go outside and have a cigarette if they want. I'm not going to stop them from smoking a cigarette. That's not my place. While they're with me, I, I don't want them to smoke in my presence. So, any sin that anybody's doing, you can come into my presence, we'll hang out, we'll do whatever, and I'll try to love you the best I can. But while you're in my presence, I don't want you to commit a sin. Whatever that sin may be. Including me, I don't want to commit a sin.